Uh, thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Richard Lockhead on an update on the impact of EU exit in Scotland's further and higher education sectors. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Richard Lockhead. Minister, please. Deputy Presiding Officer, in 63 days, the UK's new relationship with the EU will begin. A weakened relationship that Scotland made abundantly clear in the referendum of 2016 that we don't want. And for our colleges, universities, researchers and learners, this matters greatly. They have hugely benefited from our membership with the EU that has brought access to funding, talent and ideas. Our participation in programmes like Horizon 2020 and Erasmus Plus have seen our institutions secure high levels of research funding and attract large numbers of students to come and study here, and likewise many of our students to go and study and live in other countries. Now, I'd hoped to come to Parliament to report real and encouraging progre progress with the post-Brexit arrangements, to continue our relationship with the EU and to outline how Scotland will benefit from successor schemes. Instead, I have to say that we remain largely in the dark and all the benefits we have enjoyed for decades remain under serious threat as we head towards the end of the year. There remains little clarity from the UK Government on what they are thinking or what they hope to achieve by then, and as we all know, the clock is ticking. So to be clear, Brexit is potentially very, very damaging for our colleges and universities. It will lead to less funding, it will put off prospective researchers and students, exactly the sort of bright minds that Scotland needs from coming to our shores. And I share the views of Paul Nurse, a Nobel laureate and former president of the Royal Society, who commented in July that there needs to be a concerted government as an UK government effort to change its rhetoric, to be more welcoming, to fully embrace the future and think less about the past and to engage the many young people and scientists who were overwhelmingly against Brexit. And he has good reason to raise the alarm on this. A recent report by the Wellcome Trust sets out that there will be soon uh, an upfront cost of more than £13,000 for a family of four on a five-year global talent visa, in contrast to a £1,000 fee for the same family under the French talent visa. So while the UK's global talent visa is a step in the right direction, aimed at reducing potential barriers in the new visa system for world-class academics, that exorbitant cost shows that the UK government really is out of touch. And it's no wonder that EU researchers are now choosing to leave and take, in some cases, their EU research grants with them. Or, of course, many will simply not come to Scotland in the first place. These research grants come from programmes such as Horizon 2020 and a successor programme, Horizon Europe, which are of vital importance to Scotland and our researchers. They help us, fo help us foster invaluable partnerships across Europe and the world. Across disciplines and sectors, they provide opportunities for all experience levels, from early year researchers to Nobel Prize winners. Since Horizon 2020 began in 2014, Scottish organisations have won 700 and 11 million euros, winning a higher proportion of funding relative to population than any other part of the UK. In fact, Scotland produces 12% of the UK's research with 8% of the UK's population and 10% of its researchers, as outlined in the University of Scotland submission for the statement I'm sure you've all read. And that's truly an excellent track record. But I'm sure, as we're all aware, also it's not just a matter of funding alone. The Scottish Science Advisory Council report, Scotland Science Landscaped, published last year, demonstrated that research collaboration with EU countries brings the greatest academic impact, with six out of ten of Scotland's top international collaborating countries being in the EU. And it's for these reasons that we want Scotland to remain involved with Horizon. In the immediate term, we have asked the UK Government to guarantee equitable funding to Horizon 2020 participants in Scotland and to guarantee no funding gaps. If the UK becomes a third country, we have urged them to associate as soon as possible to fully fund continued participation in all parts of Horizon Europe, open to third countries, and then to plug all the funding ga gaps where alternative schemes may be required. In, compa in comparison to the clarity of our position on this issue, however, the UK Government's approach to Horizon Europe has been pretty murky at best. 
We had to wait until July this year for a clear public statement of the UK ambition for association. And too often, key information is held back from us, such as the actual costs expected from Horizon participation or the cost of any alternative, while at the same time not giving sufficient attention to devolved options and devolved responsibilities uh, for the alternative schemes that might be possible. I do, of course, welcome that there has been good UK government and UKRI engagement with us on the design of the Discovery Fund, for instance, that will be a key driver of academic excellence and international collaboration. However, the Discovery Fund is just one of three strands of alternatives for research collaboration that may be required. And we've had minimal engagement by the UK government recently on the other two. I think we can all agree that suggests a haphazard approach at best to information sharing or a selective approach at worst. This is no way to help our institutions plan for the future in these very challenging times. And just as Horizon has been a key uh, programme for our institutions in attracting funding uh, and researchers to come to our shores, Erasmus Plus has done the same for students, facilitating the mobility of individuals across Europe, be that for learning, teaching or working, Erasmus has come to signify to many of us what is good about the EU. It brings people together, it allows us to exchange culture and ideas, it fosters a wider, a wider sense of community and belonging between the nations of Europe, and Scotland, Scotland does exceptionally well from it. We attract proportionately more students from across Europe than any other part of the UK. We send proportionately more students abroad through the scheme than any other part of the UK. And between 2014 and 2018, our institution secured over 90 million euros in Erasmus funding. And just this month, we have learned that the European Commission has confirmed a 55% increase to the programme's budget, which is now sitting at over 22 billion euros. It should come as no surprise, therefore, that we want to see Scotland remain a member of Erasmus. We have made our position clear to the UK government time and time again. We have provided them with evidence which shows in no uncertain terms the economic and social benefits the programme brings to Scotland. Yet we have still to receive confirmation that this evidence has been used in the UK government's own assessment of the programme. I've also sent letters to Baroness Barron, the UK Minister for Civil Society, and John, John Whittingdale, the UK Minister of State uh, for Media and Data, concerning the incredibly important youth and community learning and development aspects of, of Erasmus uh, as well. Uh, I've yet to receive answers to those letters. And while the Department for Education have now adopted our position that all mobilities at all levels should be funded fairly, we had a long debate about that for many months, the UK Treasury refuses to accept that. They tell us that while we may not remain a part of the EU programme, the UK will develop its own version, a better version, which stretch, stretches right across the globe. But in reality, what we can expect is a very pale imitation of the real thing. What we're being presented with is a replacement programme that may see Scotland's funding for mobility cut by over 50% and support for our colleges, schools and community groups severely reduced and in some cases removed altogether. Groups like Royston Youth Action, who I met earlier in the year and who have been undertaking life-changing transformational work through Erasmus. Additionally, devolution will be ignored. If the UK government fails to associate to Erasmus Plus and looks to deploy the replacement scheme, they will, if they get their way, prevent the Parliament here, Scottish, the Scottish Parliament, having any say in how that scheme is run in Scotland. And, worryingly, UK ministers have refu refused to rule out using the Internal Market Bill to foist inferior schemes in Scotland, which, of course, would be completely unacceptable. So no matter the eventual outcome, however, Brexit, uh, I hope we can all agree, will be bad for Scotland. And it remains to be seen at this stage whether those EU programmes, so vitally important to our colleges and universities, will be part of any such deal. It is within this context that the Scottish Government has been working closely with our sectors to prepare as best as we can. We are considering, example, for example, the introduction of a new scholarship scheme to help preserve the bonds between our nearest neighbours and ourselves. We are continuing to speak with our European friends and reiterating that regardless of the outcome of the negotiations, we want to continue to work with our EU partners through research collaboration. We continue to impress upon the UK Government the urgent need to confirm association to Horizon Europe and Erasmus+. 
And we have also guaranteed, as members will know, that those EU nationals who choose to make their home in Scotland by the end of this year and are successful in gaining either settled or pre-settled status will continue to have access to our generous student support package, including the home tuition fee rate. These actions show our commitment to internationalisation, internationalism and their view that it remains a key strength of higher and further education in Scotland. But despite these efforts, it can be easy to give way to despair in the face of such dire looking prospects. The consequences for Horizon and Erasmus illustrate that Brexit and even worse, a no deal or poor deal Brexit is an act of self-sabotage that will cause severe injury to some of Scotland's most important institutions and the life chances of current and future generations and the Scottish economy. This is the last thing that our colleges and universities and young people need on top of the impact of the global pandemic. The devolved administrations have been left in the waiting room outside while the UK Treasury, the Department of Education, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy are inside Whitehall offices, Whitehall offices deciding the fate of these hugely important programmes. So as we continue to pursue a no detriment policy for EU programmes in terms of funding and participation, we will use the coming weeks to do all we can to protect Scotland's interests and prevent the UK Government inflicting untold damage on our relationship with Europe. And I thank Parliament for the opportunity to provide this update on these very important issues today. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions of the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow on 20 minutes for questions. I can ask those members who wish to ask a question to press the request to speak button now. And I call Kenneth Gibson. Before I move on, I'm not sure about Dean Lockhart. He's down for number. Is he remote? Is he here? Oh, you're, you're doing it. Are you, Ms. Smith? That's fine. That was. Oh well, it's some, we, no, the pigeon's not arrived yet. Um, can, I, can I call Kenneth Gibson, followed by Liz Smith? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the Minister's statement. Can I ask him what recent discussions he's had with his UK government counterparts regarding the UK's future involvement in Erasmus, given that his letters are being ignored? And does he share my concerns that any UK alternative being considered at Westminster will not go far enough, and that we could potentially lose out on the next funding programme for Erasmus Plus, which is set to double in size to €30 billion Euros for the 2021? 27 programme. Minister. Um, I have had numerous conversations and meetings with uh, the UK Universities Minister over Erasmus and also my uh, devolved administration counterparts uh, as well. And we continue to hammer home the point that you know, we were given insurance during the referendum in 2016 that Scotland would not lose out uh, from Brexit. And here we are facing a situation where our students, our young people and our uh, institutions in terms of universities and colleges uh, are set to really lose out um, significant amounts of resources and experiences. And it is also the case, as Kenneth Gibson says, that ironically a time when we would have had uh, an increased budget coming to Scotland for Erasmus programmes and potentially Horizon as well, uh, we actually face the scenario of getting less than what we had before, and that is absolutely mm -hmm. unacceptable. I think you're about to tell me you're, you're, you're going to translate yourself into someone else now, are you? No, you're not. I, I, oh, well, I could, that's I could good. Never, I could uh, never do that. <laughs> Just to confirm, I, I think uh, Chief Whip Miles Briggs did send a message to the Whip's office to confirm that our order uh, was uh, Jamie Green first, Jamie Halco Johnson, and then myself. Uh, Dean Lockhart had to pull out. That pigeon's not arrived. The other one had just arrived. That one hadn't, so I'm lost now. Is it you, Miss Smith, next? No, it's Jamie Green next. So there we go. Jamie Green to be, <laughs> to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Jamie Green, please. Thank you, uh, finally. I was just about to welcome Mr Gibson to the opposition benches, but he does a good job of that himself. I bet, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It's me that's getting muddled up now. You're quite right. You don't need to tell me. You don't need to tell me. I, it's... <laughs> right. Wipe the tape. It's, J it's Jamie Green to be followed by Ian Gray. Quite right, Mr Gray. I need a holiday. Mr Green. We, we all do. Um, can I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement today? Um, but it is just that. It's a lengthy statement of some very well-rehearsed views on both Brexit and the UK government. Views we've all heard in this chamber many times. 
before. But he does make some perfectly valid points around Horizon and Erasmus Plus and what comes next, because I too want to see progress on these, and I know the universities I speak to want to see progress on them as well. But I do know that Mr Lockhead does have frequent and regular meetings with the UK University's Minister. My understanding is those meetings are productive and that he and his officials have participated in domestic alternative workshop, workshops on a number of, of key issues. He will have ample opportunity to convey his concerns directly in those meetings to the UK Government, and I uh, commend him for doing so. But on the substance of what he's talking about today, let me ask some additional questions. Given that the decision to remove home status for EU students, uh, can he confirm that the funding savings from that decision will be reallocated within Scottish budgets to lift the unfair cap on Scottish domicile students? That's the first point. Secondly, can he confirm that he will support Scottish universities who do want to participate and partake in UK-funded alternative schemes that do replace Horizon and Erasmus+. Plus. And thirdly, since we know that his government recently turned down uh, an offer uh, to participate in a UK-wide scheme to assist our universities who are in dire need, can he confirm that he is still positively working and committed to working with the UK government constructively on any future higher education funding schemes? Minister, please, and if we can be brief with him. Um, Thank Jamie Green for his questions. There's a lot of questions there. Um, and in terms of our engagement with the UK government, yes, we have had reasonable engagement with the UK government throughout this year. However, it's often a question of they are hearing what we say, but they're not necessarily listening to what we say. And of course, the decisions are with the UK Treasury, who are objecting to some of the solutions put forward from Scotland, and indeed the other devolved administrations, I understand, to ensure we can have continuity in terms of these vital programmes for Scotland. In terms of the... Uh, ceasing of EU students having their fees paid, home fees paid in Scotland. Uh, we have already said that, that money remains within the, the higher education budget. Uh, and in terms of working with our universities on any UK alternative schemes, of course we will work with our universities to access any UK alternative schemes. What we are saying is these alternative schemes are going to be much inferior to what we have at the moment, and they will not necessarily be suited to Scottish circumstances and the needs of Scotland's research base, or indeed our young people in terms of harassment schemes. And that's our real concerns. We are going to end up in a much worse position uh, post-Brexit than what we were when we were in Europe, and indeed compared to what we were promised by the UK government. Uh, and that is an unacceptable situation. I call Ian Gray. My apologies, Mr Gray. Not at all. Thank you, President Officer. And um, let me agree with pretty well uh, everything the Minister said in his statement. Brexit is a disaster. It will impact negatively on our universities, colleges, staff and students in all the ways that he laid out. The Tory government have completely failed to develop or agree the successor arrangements we so badly need to be in place, or indeed any post-Brexit arrangements with the European Union. It is absolutely the Tory government's fault, and it is dreadful. But we do need to hear from the Minister what he is going to do to address the threat if he has to. So will he tell us how will the Scottish Government step up to secure research funding in our universities and employability courses and colleges? And what arrangements are they planning to allow exchange of staff and students should we fall out of Erasmus? It will take more than a scholarship scheme to protect these critical sectors. It's not his fault, but it is his responsibility. Minister. There's always a but, but I'm happy to answer the question. I mean, Scotland has a lot of fans uh, in the European Union. And we have had tremendously positive feedback from Germany and other countries who want to work closely with Scotland, irrespective of what happens. But clearly the resources available for us to take forward these kinds of initiatives and programmes will be extremely limited because the UK have the purse strings mm -hmm. and they have the obligation to make sure there's no detriment to Scotland from Brexit as they promised the people of Scotland, promised their universities, promised their young people, our colleges and researchers and so on. And they have to deliver uh, on that promise. Can I also commend the universities because they're putting a lot of effort into setting up bilateral arrangements with their European counterparts. That's very difficult. It's not as, nearly as good as what we will have with full participation of Erasmus and Horizon. And we are supporting those efforts as well and continue to do so before. But we have a few weeks or a month or two left to make sure the UK stick to their commitments and associate with Erasmus or full participation and likewise with Horizon as well. Kathy Gibson, followed by Liz Smith. 
Officer, I welcome the Minister's statement. Scotland has a strong global reputation for punching above its weight and producing world-class research, and we know that research has been strengthened by EU citizens working in Scotland by our membership of the European Union. Can I ask what action the Scottish Government is taking to protect that research collaboration with Europe, as the UK Tory Government refuses to provide any clarity on our future involvement with Horizon 2020? Minister. In response to Kenneth Gibson's second question, can I just say that uh, I... I very much welcome his question. Uh, however, uh, can, I, can I assure him that uh, I have been in contact with uh, other European Union countries uh, to explain that Scotland is absolutely determined to continue our international collaboration. And we, uh, as I said in my previous answer to Ian Gray, we are getting very positive feedback from other European countries who very much value their collaboration with Scottish institutions. And we are going to do everything we can within devolved powers to support that going forward. But as I said before, we have a few weeks or two months left for the UK government to deliver on its obligations. Otherwise, enormous damage will be inflicted on our university's research base uh, and young people. Liz Smith, followed by Annabelle Ewing. Uh, it should actually be Jamie Hulker Johnson, but I'll ask my question very quickly. Um, Minister, if, if, there, if there was a situation whereby the Erasmus Plus uh, scheme, the negotiations for that, didn't work out in the way that we all hope that they will, would the Scottish Government be in a position to agree with the UK Government to have a UK-wide um, social mobility um, plan for students right across the UK? Minister. I will continue to do what I think is best for, for Scotland's young people in line with our, for our commitment to uh, ensuring these kind of programmes uh, continue. Uh, we would have rather had the opportunity to have our own unilateral relationship with Erasmus and Horizon, even as a devolved country. But as you may be aware, the Paymaster General wrote to Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary for Constitution, Europe and External Affairs, on the 13th of July, uh, where she said, I confirm that the UK Government will not be negotiating separate participation for individual devolved administrations. So that route, unfortunately, was blocked off because of Scotland's constitutional status and the attitude of the Tory, the Tory government uh, in London. But we will uh, clearly look for any opportunity to make sure there's still international collaboration with students from Europe and inward mobility and outward mobility. Annabelle Ewing, followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Erasmus programme, which my mother, Winnie Ewing, was instrumental in getting off the ground when she was MEP for the Highlands and Islands follows on from a centuries-old and enriching tradition of Scots students studying at European universities. Can the Minister advise how many students will be impacted by the UK Government pulling the plug on Erasmus? And is it not the case that continuing membership of Erasmus would be yet Another example of the advantages of independence. I need short questions, please. Uh, Minister. Uh, can I thank Annabelle Ewing for raising the tremendous legacy from Madame Ecos, Winnie Ewing, in terms of Erasmus, which has been an enormously valuable programme for Scotland, which we've taken advantage of more than any other part of the UK, uh, as I said previously. And it's important in the context of Annabelle's question, Annabelle Ewing's question, that uh, the UK government appeared to be focusing on Erasmus largely being for higher education students. In Scotland, people from youth organisations, from colleges, from other walks of life, apprentices, as well as higher education students, have taken massive advantage of Erasmus. And at the moment, under the current proposals, albeit they're vague and we can't actually pin them down, there's a huge danger that the UK government are proposing that any future scheme is focused on higher education students, not young people generally, who have enormously benefited from that scheme. And that's a very important point uh, that Annabel Ewing makes. And, of course, that Scotland, if we were to rejoin Europe, as an independent country, our young people will regain these massive benefits from that new constitutional status. Claire Baker, followed by George Adam. Uh, President Officer, I hope this has not come to pass, but in the event of leaving the shared programmes, what is the Scottish Government's strategy to retain and recruit international academics and students? The Minister mentioned a scholarship programme, but will that be part of a wider reaching approach? And what discussions is he having with the Minister for Migration about the importance of HE and FE? Minister. Uh, thank you. And clearly, you know, the, the Scottish Government uh, very much want to continue our international links with other European countries and let our, ben our young people and our researchers and others benefit from that. But we don't have immigration powers. We don't have the budgets which we were promised would be 
passed to Scotland post-Brexit for Erasmus and Horizon in terms of no detriment if we were to vote for Brexit as a, as a UK state, never mind Scotland's opposition to it. Um, and, you know, we don't have foreign affairs. So if we need the UK government to deliver for Scotland, for our young people, college and universities. And yes, we will look at scholarships and what we can do within devolved powers. But the real benefits here are to be secured from the UK government fulfilling its promises. George Adam, followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Minister agree with me that the Scottish Parliament has rejected the UK's government's attempts to override devolution by pushing through their internal market bill? He will be aware that the UK Education Secretary has refused to rule out interfering in Scotland's free tuition fees after Brexit and after years of refusing to back free tuition for Scottish students. It comes as no surprise that the Scottish Tories will always do, the fo go do and follow behind their UK leaders. Does the Minister agree with me that the only way Scotland can continue to protect free education is by becoming an independent country? Uh, Minister, short questions please. I think it's a real concern for this Parliament, uh, for, for all parties, that we have a situation just now where the UK Government have not ruled out using the Internal Market Bill to foist an inferior Erasmus scheme on Scotland. Uh, we should all be concerned about that as MSPs and elected by the people of Scotland to protect devolution. Um, and of course, uh, as George Adams says, it's no wonder that support for independence in Scotland has gone up to 58% and thereabouts in the opinion polls, because the real examples, the real examples of how real people will lose out from Brexit, something we did not vote for, are issues like Erasmus and the Horizon Research uh, investment monies, which underpin the Scottish economy. And this is only going to fuel uh, the case for Scottish independence. Uh, and, and likewise, um, you know, these issues will be used to illustrate why we need our own voice in Europe. Uh, Ross Greer, followed by Rowan Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I note with sadness but no surprise what the Minister said about the UK Government refusing to negotiate on behalf of devolved nations who wish to fully participate in schemes like Erasmus. Given that, will the Scottish Government, or has the Scottish Government already, used some of the goodwill Scotland currently has across Europe to make a direct application, a direct request to the European Union that we participate to the greatest extent possible in schemes like Erasmus. Minister, did you hear all that? Yes. Uh, can I thank Ross Greer for his question? And yes, I give an absolute commitment that the Scottish Government will continue to have a dialogue with the European Commission, the European Union and all European countries that we want to continue uh, that cross-European collaboration and have the student exchange programmes uh, and research collaboration as well, which are so valuable uh, to Scotland. And we have enormous goodwill in Europe and we will capitalise on that as much as possible to protect the interests of future generations. Rona Mackay, followed by Beatrice Swisher. I don't think the Erasmus yeah. programme and other areas does the Minister agree with me that this is an insult to democracy and to thousands of Scottish young people who could lose out on this life-enhancing uh, experience? Minister. Uh, well, thanks to, to, to Rona Mackay. I mean, I think it's, it's an important point because, you know, when I went and met the young people at Royston Action in Glasgow, uh, Royston Youth Action in Glasgow, and they... Um, they stirred up my emotions because they spoke to me about how taking part in Erasmus benefited their lives and changed their perspectives. And these uh, are the kind of people who are going to lose out if we don't have proper participation in future Erasmus programmes, not just for higher education university students, but for people from youth organisations and colleges, apprentices and others who have benefited in the past. And therefore, uh, Rona, Rhoda Grant uh, Mackay is quite right to highlight the fact uh, that young people will lose out and it's, not, it's an affront to democracy that they did not want this and they did not vote for it. Beatrice Wishart, followed by Jamie Halper Johnson. Thank you, President. So, ending freedom of movement, making our country less open through barriers and restrictions, will hurt Scotland's world class academic institutions. The Minister said, quote, that more and more EU researchers are now choosing to leave. Research by the Liberal Democrats revealed that at the end of last year, almost 2,500 EU academics had left Scottish universities already. In terms of the loss of talent and expertise, what further, and what further loss there might be, what work has been done to quantify and monitor this to inform future decision-making? Minister. 
Well, it's an important point that Beatrice Wishart makes as well, because we do know from the feedback from our institutions that many researchers have chosen to leave and in some cases take their research grants with them to other parts of Europe. And we have to remember that Scotland's world-leading institutions or universities and colleges, uh, they are built on the successful relationship they've had with Europe. Therefore, going forward, we should all be concerned about that investment from Europe being lost. Uh, and also our research reputation and science reputation as a nation is built on the success of, of gaining uh, investment from uh, uh, Horizon 2020 and other programmes uh, as well. So we will pay attention to that. One thing, of course, we cannot measure is how many um, bright minds from across Europe and leading academics have chosen not to apply for jobs in Scotland because of Brexit. We know that is the case. That's very difficult to quantify, and it's such a shame that's happening. Jamie Halker johnson followed by John Mason. Uh, the Minister spoke at some length on research collaboration, so could he clarify for me uh, what proportion of this collaborative research work takes place with institutions in the rest of the UK and what the Scottish Government is doing to support Scottish universities to grow collaboration with institutions across the rest of the United Kingdom? Minister. Well, Jimmy Halcrow Johnson, although I think he's not coming from the same direction as myself in terms of this topic, it does raise an important point in that we do have other sources of research monies within the UK, and therefore we're paying very close attention to the UKRI uh, research funds, which it's really important that Scotland also maintains its disproportionate benefit from going forward as well. But we've seen some changes taking place there also, which we have to keep a very close eye on. So I can assure Jamie Halcrow Johnson that we are... Um, in regular touch with UKRI and the other research funds that are available to Scottish institutions to make sure that Scotland can maintain its fair share of those funds. Short questions and answers to match like the last two members and John Mason to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the Minister talked about the UK possibly sending students across the globe. Uh, and I don't know where that means, maybe Australia, New Zealand, but surely it's better for students and more students could travel if it's in Europe rather than so far away. Minister. Scotland at the moment, uh, aside from today's particular debate, uh, supports international collaboration and, and scholarships across the globe. And the very, very successful Saltire Scholarships is one example of that, where we literally have thousands of applications for the number of Saltire Scholarships we have in Scotland, which support students from India, Pakistan, various other countries around the world to come and study in Scotland, live here for a while. Uh, and the uh, take back enormous goodwill from Scotland when they go back to their home countries as well. So I think we have to remain an international outlooking country, attract students and talent from Europe and indeed the rest of the world at the same time. Daniel Johnson. Thank you. Uh, the, the Minister rightly points to the loss of research funding being one of the biggest uh, consequences of Brexit. But in its most recent report on higher education finances, Audit Scotland pointed out that publicly available uh, funding uh, domestically uh, only uh, provides 80% cost recovery for research undertaken by our universities. So surely any response to these issues needs to take that point and acknowledge that and address that first and foremost. Minister, briefly, sorry. Uh, Daniel Johnson highlights a number of challenges that face the future of further and higher education Scotland that have been compounded by the current global pandemic. And he'll be aware that we've asked the Scottish Funding Council to review the sustainability of further and higher education in Scotland at this pivotal moment, with the world economy changing, with demographic challenges with the global pandemic and with Brexit. There are a number of issues that we have to get right going forward to maintain Scotland's world leading reputation. Uh, and he will be aware that we allocated an extra 75 million pounds of research funds to Scotland's universities a few months ago in response to the global pandemic. And that was warmly welcomed by the sector. And I think that's a really good illustration of this government's commitment to maintaining Scotland's international rep rep reputation as a centre of science and research excellence. Thank you. That concludes questions on the impact of the EU exit in Scotland's further and higher ed education sectors. I did add in an extra five minutes for the wee bit of a kerfuffle in the middle. If you weren't here, it wasn't much of a kerfuffle. Um